The name of Billy Graham is probably the most recognizable name in the world of Christendom since around 1950. Most would credit him with being the greatest evangelist in Christian history. We would not agree with that assessment. We would say that Billy Graham is the most deceptive preacher in Christian history. And if you will listen to this study of his ministry in its entirety, you will be challenged to agree with us or you'll be faced with denying the facts as they stand. As we produce this expose of his life, Billy Graham is near the end of his life. This might lead some to wonder why we would bother to spend time on Graham. After all, he is no longer active in ministry. But the fact is, when Billy passes on, there will be a world blitz of his message. Documentaries and tributes will appear in all quarters. Entire magazine issues will be dedicated to his memory. His books, CDs, videos, and other works will sell into the hundreds of millions. He'll have hundreds of millions of hits on his website. And what message will these people hear? If the effect of Graham's message on the world during his life was to help strengthen Rome and build the world church, what will this wave of materials after his death have on a new generation that is already being swept up into the Alexandrian Bibles and apostate emergent church movement. Give your life to Christ tonight. Let him give you a new heart, make you a new person, and give you the joy and the peace that you've always longed for. Now, it'll cost you something. It doesn't come cheap. It costs Christ his blood. It costs God his son, and it'll cost you your sins. He demands that you deny self, take up the cross, take his unpopularity, take your place with him in suffering if need be, but in return he'll give you a new heart. He'll accept you into his kingdom. He'll forgive the past. He'll make you a new creation. That was Billy preaching in 1957. His message appeared strong, but he was already selling out to the spirit of Antichrist and the ecumenical movement. Stay with us, and you're going to be shocked at the deception that took place beginning as early as 1950. Billy Graham was saved in a revival meeting in 1934 under the preaching of a great fundamentalist preacher named Mordecai Ham. He went to Bob Jones College, but found the rules too rigid, so he transferred to Florida Bible Institute. Graham's own reflection on this move on page 46 of his autobiography titled, Just As I Am, is very telling. He says, quote, One thing that thrilled me was the diversity of viewpoints we were exposed to in the classroom a wondrous blend of ecumenical and evangelical thought that was really ahead of its time, end quote. Key word there, ecumenical. This would explain why Graham would still be struggling over the issue of the infallibility of Scripture right up to the time of the L.A. Crusade that would catapult Graham into worldwide fame. Again, on page 136 of his autobiography, Graham said, quote, the particular problem I was wrestling with for the first time since my conversion as a teenager was the inspiration and authority of the scriptures, end quote. The Florida Bible Institute is an Alexandrian institution that corrected the King James Bible and planted the seeds of apostasy in so doing. The Florida Bible Institute represents the typical evangelical and fundamentalist Bible school today. It left Graham without faith in his Bible and left him completely void of any appreciation for the necessity of rejecting heresy and apostasy. He then said on page 139 of his autobiography, quote, With the Los Angeles campaign galloping toward me, I had to have an answer. If I could not trust the Bible, I could not go on. I would have to quit the school presidency. I would have to leave pulpit evangelism, end quote. He then described a walk he took in the woods where he laid his Bible on a stump and he prayed. His account of this prayer was to say, Father, I am going to accept this as thy word by faith. I am going to allow faith to go beyond my intellectual questions and doubts, and I will believe this to be your inspired word. Billy was holding a King James Bible in his hands. That would change. 
Billy obviously had questions, and those questions were obviously the result of the reuse of the Alexandrian critical theory and text, and it appears that instead of getting solid answers, he began to hobnob with liberals and neo-evangelicals like Carl F. H. Henry. Here is Graham introducing Henry at the Berlin World Congress on Evangelization in 1966. Dr. Carl Henry is going to come and bring an address to us at this time, and I think we ought to say a word of appreciation. Thank you very much for those gracious and undeserved words, Dr. Graham. In a booklet titled Evangelism and the Church Today, Billy Graham gave to workers at his crusades. He writes, quote, The great theologians of today are Rudolf Boltmann, Karl Barth, Emil Brunner, Reinhold Niebuhr, Paul Tillich, and Carl Henry, end quote. Only Henry out of that whole bunch, believed the Bible at all. Boltmann, Barth, Bruner, Niebuhr, and Tillich were complete apostates. <music> Billy Graham was virtually unknown to most of the world until he came to the city of Los Angeles in 1949. While in Los Angeles, for reasons that no one has really uncovered, William Randolph Hearst ordered his publications to, quote, Puff Graham. They did. He was front-page news, and that headline was repeated the world over. He was all the talk on radio, TV, and in movie theaters across the country. The following is the audio from a newsreel that played all over America in theaters while the L.A. Crusades were going on. You can imagine the excitement of Christians who saw the signs of a possible national revival on the horizon. The city of Los Angeles, California has grown to such proportions that it covers many square miles between the Sierra Madre Mountains and the Pacific Ocean. In this area, Four million men, women, and children live going to and fro, seeking, reaching, waiting. From Minneapolis comes the young evangelist Billy Graham and song leader Cliff Barrows, his wife Billy Barrows, and Beverly Shea, the gospel singer, to cooperate with Christ for Greater Los Angeles in a great revival campaign. At the corner of Washington and Hill Streets in the city of Los Angeles, the largest tent ever erected for a revival meeting is now complete and is called the Canvas Cathedral. And the tent is filled to capacity day after day as men and women flock to hear the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There are 6,500 people seated here in this Canvas Cathedral, and several thousands more stand around the sides of the tent. Approximately 350,000 total attendance in two months. Because of the goodness and grace of God, I can say tonight I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. Every moving of the Spirit of God has been accompanied with great singing, and so it has been in this campaign. A vast throng of earnest people gather here Sunday afternoons and every evening to hear the beautiful gospel music, inspiring testimonies, and to hear the Word of God preached in the power of the Spirit by Dr. Billy Graham to the salvation of thousands. I do not believe that any man, that any man can solve the problems of life without Jesus Christ. There are tremendous marital problems. There are physical problems. There are financial problems. There are problems of sin and habit that cannot be solved outside the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you trusted Christ Jesus as Savior? Tonight, I'm glad to tell you as we close that the Lord Jesus Christ can be received. 
Your sins forgiven. Your burdens lifted. Your problems solved. By turning your life over to Him, repenting of your sin, and turning to Jesus Christ as Savior. Shall we pray? By the time of the close of the L.A. Crusade, the entire English-speaking press and many foreign language papers and magazines had introduced Billy Graham to the world, and we might say, the rest is history, but we would be wrong. You see, Billy's biographers will, for the most part, ignore the horrible damage that Billy Graham did to Christianity in America. They're paid to do that. But what would cause President Harry Truman to call him a counterfeit and publicity seeker, according to Time Magazine, November 15, 1993? The same article quotes Bob Jones III saying that Graham, quote, has done more harm to the cause of Christ than any other living man, end quote. Why would these and so many other men say such things about Billy Graham? Well, if you don't know the answer to that, you need to pay attention. What you're about to hear is horribly disturbing. Billy Graham has been working to build a false church since the earliest days of his ministry. And that is why this study is so important. Billy is at the end of his life, but when he dies, you will see a massive global campaign to capitalize on his death by selling billions of dollars worth of paraphernalia, and the result will be the global proclamation of Graham's gospel, a gospel of inclusion. Those are Billy's own words. In a 2005 interview with Kathy Lynn Grossman of USA Today, Graham says, quote, there are a lot of groups that feel a little bit strange around me because I am inclusive, end quote. But asked whether God has forsaken America, Graham's answer is fast and firm, no. Grossman comments that Graham's reply stands on faith, quoting him again saying, quote, The Lord said, I will never forsake you. No matter how sinful we are, how bad we are, God loves us, at least from my point of view. I believe he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for us because he loves us and he doesn't have any termination to that love, end quote. You see, Billy Graham preaches the cross of his own making, a Jesus of his own imagination. He preaches antinomianism, he preaches heresy, and he preaches a false gospel. Many well-meaning folks take a promise to Israel in Psalm 105.15 and apply it to preachers saying, Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. Read that passage in its context and you'll find that it has no application to a Gentile preacher, but regards the Jews. The Bible teaches us to be like the Bereans in Acts 17.11 and test everything a preacher says by the word of God. And we'll do that with Billy Graham and everyone who preaches. 1 John 4, 1 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Jesus rebuked all religious leaders of his day. John the Baptist had done the same as he prepared the way for Jesus. After being saved, Paul would denounce false teachers by name, as he did Alexander the coppersmith in 2 Timothy 4.14. Paul even rebuked Peter for heresy. It is a sad fact that so few men in pulpits have warned their flocks about the wolves in sheep's clothing, including Billy Graham. So many men today excuse their effeminate, soft approach by calling it love and saying that they are trying to be more like Jesus. Well, that is a lie. Jesus said in Matthew 7:15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. If Jesus warned people, why don't the men who claim to be preachers do the same? As mentioned, Graham's fame began with the L.A. Crusade in 1949. Graham made this statement in August 1948 at a luncheon at the Conservative Baptist Association's convention in Milwaukee. When asked, Billy, what do you expect the World Council of Churches to do in August? 
He replied, quote, I believe that they are going to nominate the Antichrist, end quote. Billy still had some of that Apostle Paul fire in him that he had picked up from Mordecai Ham and Bob Jones Sr., but things would change. According to page 694 of his autobiography, Graham was attending the World Council of Churches International Meetings as early as 1961. Here is a clip from Billy's introductory message to the World Congress on Evangelism held at Berlin, Germany in 1966, where he is already speaking favorably of the World Council of Churches openly. Fifty-six years ago, a World Missionary Conference at Edinburgh, Scotland, met to consider the opportunities and responsibilities of evangelizing the world in their generation. From this assembly sprang the Faith and Order Movement, Life and Work Movement, and the International Missionary Council. These three movements became the nucleus of what is now called the World Council of Churches. By 1974, Graham was openly embracing the apostates. At his Luzanne Congress that year, Graham stated, quote, I have nothing but the warmest of relations with the World Council of Churches, end quote. Billy went on in this message in 1966 to paint the picture that the great evangelists, including Moody, Tory, and others, had something to do with the establishment of the World Council. That is a blatantly dishonest picture to paint. Moody especially never sent converts to Rome and never joined any liberal organizations. You need to understand something. If you're like me, you've been told by a lot of people that Billy really didn't start going bad until very recently. But that is simply just not true. Let's go back to 1949 and follow Billy's career. We will quote him, quote news reports, and listen to his own words from his own mouth. And we will see that the 50s was a decade of pure deceit on the part of Billy Graham as he used Bible-believing fundamentalists to build his ministry and then went on to completely embrace apostasy. Billy Graham gives his own account in his autobiography titled Just As I Am and reveals his own deceit. On page 162, he tells us of his first major southern crusade that took place less than a year after the L.A. crusade. This crusade took place in Columbia, South Carolina in the winter of 1950. Graham describes the work of Willis Haymaker, who joined the Graham team in Columbia, South Carolina, saying, quote, he would also call on the local Catholic bishop and other clerics to acquaint them with crusade plans and invite them to the meetings. They would usually appoint a priest to attend and report back. This was years before Vatican II's openness to Protestants, but we were concerned to let the Catholic bishops see that my goal, listen to this, was not to get people to leave their churches, rather I wanted them to commit their lives to Christ, end quote. This is incredible. Why? Well, for starters, he was admitting that he did not want people to leave their Catholic churches when they got saved. Also, at the same time that Graham is opening his ministry to Rome, he is still using fundamentalists like Bob Jones Jr. Here is how Graham describes it, quote, that itinerary included a return to Bob Jones University, where I was introduced to a crowded auditorium by Bob Jones, Jr. My sermon, which was on Belshazzar that day, was also carried live on the campus radio station, end quote. Graham was using Bob Jones, knowing that Bob Jones is militantly opposed to Rome and the ecumenical movement, and behind the scenes, Graham is cozying up to the Vatican. This is blatantly dishonest and inexcusably unethical, and it's only 1950. That same year, Robert Ketchum of the General Association of Regular Baptist Churches saw a newspaper report of Graham's work in Oregon. The report claimed that Graham had turned over the so-called decision cards to Roman Catholic churches. Graham's executive secretary, Jerry Bevan, responded to Ketchum and there is no doubt that Graham knew that the fundamentalists were being lied to since he admits as much in his autobiography. 
Bevan replied to Ketchum saying, quote, You asked if Billy Graham had invited Roman Catholics and Jews to cooperate in the evangelistic meetings. Such a thought, even if the reporter did suggest it as having come from Mr. Graham, seems ridiculous to me. Surely you must know that it is not true. Further, that you should give any credence to the idea that Mr. Graham would ever turn over any decision cards to the Roman Catholic Church seems inconceivable, end quote. The truth, Billy was lying to Bevan, and Bevan resigned less than four months before the New York Crusade. Billy claims that this was for personal reasons on page 300 of his autobiography, but Billy has already demonstrated that he has a problem with the truth. But Bob Jones wasn't the only one lied to and used. Jerry Bevan and R.T. Ketchum weren't the only ones lied to. Graham also used Jack Wurtzen in 1950 to fill in for him during a 15-city tour. Graham would use Wurtzen when needed. Then, Wurtzen would rally Bible-believing churches in New York, and they would invite Graham to come to town. But Graham would reject the invitation of the Bible-believing churches. Why? Graham was waiting to be invited by the liberals. And when the Liberal Protestant Council invited him in 1957, he accepted the invitation and shunned Wurtzen and the fundamentalists. The worst of Graham's betrayals involved John R. Rice of the Sword of the Lord publications. In 1955, Rice flew to Scotland and took part in a crusade with Graham. Billy told the elder evangelist, quote, I have promised God I will never have on my committee working in an active way in any of my campaigns, men who do not believe in the virgin birth of Christ, who do not believe in the blood atonement of Jesus Christ, who do not believe in the verbal inspiration of the Bible. These men will never be on my committee. I have promised God. End quote. Well, Billy lied to God. Did you get that? Billy promised God and lied to him. Never mind the fact that he lied to Bob Jones Sr., Bob Jones Jr., R.T. Ketchum, Jack Wurtson, and John R. Rice. Billy Graham lied to God. Even his personal friends were pushed aside as they begged him to repent. A prominent New York attorney named James Bennett, who was also Graham's friend from Wheaton College, confronted Billy about his sin of embracing apostates and the Roman Catholic Church. Billy rejected the pleas from Mr. Bennett, who then wrote and published a public warning about Graham's ministry in a paper titled, The Billy Graham New York Crusade, Why I Cannot Support It, A Ministry of Disobedience. Graham believed that his message justified his sin. Graham believed that it was right to do wrong in order to do right. This next clip is a portion of Graham's final message that was delivered in the open air at Times Square during the New York Crusade in 1957. In this clip, Graham says clearly that there is only one way to heaven. You say yes, but what we're going to see in a moment is that Graham denies that today and his ministry has confirmed he never believed it. And I tell you, that is our only hope. There is no other way out. There is no other way of survival except through him. I have not been able to get my hands on the article, but the Billy Graham ministry confirmed to John MacArthur that as early as 1960, they published an article by Billy Graham where he denies that you must be saved through Jesus Christ. He denies what you just heard from his clip from 1957. Three years after that clip you just heard, he published an article in Decision Magazine refuting himself. In a few minutes, we will play two very recent clips where Graham denies what you just heard him preach. I believe it is obvious that Billy believed that his message was the end and compromise was the means and that as long as his message was sound, the compromise should have been acceptable. On pages 302 through 304 of his autobiography, he mentions Bob Jones, John R. Rice, and Carl McIntyre by name, 
and says, quote, It was not the first time some of them had raised their objections to my growing ecumenism, of course, but the New York crusade marked their final break with our work, end quote. Graham claimed that through Bible study and prayer, he and Ruth agreed that these men of God and all his predecessors like Billy Sunday, D.L. Moody, John Wesley, etc., were all wrong. He compared himself to Nehemiah, whose enemies tried to keep him from building the walls of Jerusalem. But Bill had it completely backwards. Billy has operated under serious deception. Nehemiah was commanded to build the walls, and his enemies were unbelievers. To the contrary, Billy is condemned by Scripture, which is the Word of God, for what he is doing, and his enemies are Bible-believing Christians. And Billy's friends are the Christ-rejecting liberals and Roman Catholics. But listen closely to this next clip. Billy Graham destroyed lives. He preached a decent gospel message years ago, but Graham is appealing to those who had made quote-unquote decisions to dedicate themselves to serve God in the churches. But he's deceiving these people and sending them into apostate and Roman Catholic churches. What a moment this is. What an hour this is. Will we ever see it again? Will there ever be such a moment again when we have such an opportunity to give our lives to Christ? And then for every Christian here, let this be a moment of dedication. Let this be a moment when we rededicate our lives to Christ. I'm determined that from now on, we are going to live for Christ, follow Christ, and serve Christ, faithfully and loyally in the fellowship of the church, until we shall see in America a great spiritual revival sweeping from coast to coast. Billy was excited about the prospects of these new professing Christians serving in what he called the church, but he was spiritually insane. He was sending them to the whore of Babylon, where they would receive false doctrine and be condemned to follow the sacraments and serving the denomination. Graham's logic can be found on page 303 of his autobiography. He says, quote, Our message was clear, and if someone with a radically different theological view somehow decided to join with us in a crusade that proclaimed Christ as the way of salvation, he or she was the one who was compromising personal convictions, not we, end quote. He sent these poor, uninformed sheep to Rome and apostate Protestant churches, where they were taught false doctrines and led into apostasy. Some who were truly saved come out of those churches and into good churches. Others just fell into a stagnant state of uselessness, but many others were victims of Billy Graham's apostasy. Unlike the campaigns of Billy Sunday, D.L. Moody, George Whitfield, John Wesley, and others, when Billy Graham left town, nothing changed except the strengthened condition of Roman Catholicism and apostate Protestantism. Later that same year, in an interview with the San Francisco News dated September 21, 1957, Graham said, quote, Anyone who makes a decision at our meetings is seen later and referred to a local clergyman, Protestant, Catholic, or Jewish. End quote. There is absolutely no doubt that Billy Graham was a deceiver as early as 1950. The 60s were tumultuous for the American nation and for the world. Corruption reigned in government and in business as well as the ministry of Billy Graham. Billy had secretly built a lasting relationship with the Pope. Billy had fully embraced the liberal apostates. And what most people don't know is that Billy had also begun to deny scripture and openly embrace devil-possessed scholars who attacked God's word, blasphemed Jesus Christ, and mocked the cross. Hayes Minnick a minister with the Orlando Bible Church, quotes Graham in February 1962 regarding the Genesis account. Quote, 
in this paradise that God had built, called the Garden of Eden, you can take it symbolically, you can take it literally. It makes no difference as far as the truth and meaning is concerned. End quote. Here is Billy speaking at Harvard Law Forum in 1962, where he sends a message loud and clear that he isn't going to stand against liberals or communism. I would like to add this comment that um, I believe that a Christian is a person that is to live Christ under any form of government, uh, whether it be Rome or whether it be uh, communism or whether it be Nazism, that we are to live Christ in the midst of that situation in so far as we possibly can. And I would like to say, lest it be misunderstood, uh, because one or two people brought it up earlier, I am not a member of, nor am I identified with, any left-wing organization or right-wing organization. And I am simply, in my work, trying to be a Christian and stay in the, uh, in, in the center uh, of, of proclaiming the gospel, which I believe is an answer to the individual in any society under any form of government. A true man of God will stand against sin. And a Christian doesn't just live Christ, as Billy puts it. When he lives in a constitutional republic, he has a duty to stand for what is right and to vote and to stand against the left wing whose philosophy is anti-Christian and whose lack of biblical morality makes them the enemies of the cross. I am not advocating party affiliation. I am advocating biblical truth. And herein lies the issue. Either Billy Graham is what Stalin called a useful idiot, or Billy Graham is a devil. When Billy visited the Soviet Union in 1982, he ignored the millions of slaughtered Christians and the unknown tens of thousands of imprisoned believers who were being worked to death in slave labor camps. Billy stood in Moscow and told the world, there's nothing to see here. Billy's willingness to be used as Soviet propaganda shocked millions inside and outside of Russia. The San Diego Union, May 14, 1982, put it well, quote, Dr. Graham has permitted his good name and his ministry to be exploited for the benefit of Soviet propaganda. It was bad enough that Dr. Graham lent his name and presence to the Soviet-sponsored Worldwide Conference of Religious Workers for Saving the Sacred Gift of Life from Nuclear Catastrophe. This affair was never destined to be anything more than a thoroughly manipulated component of the Soviet Union's patently duplicitous peace offensive. Its purpose is to weaken Western defenses." End quote. This betrayal of the brethren is seen vividly in the movie called The Printing, available on DVD. Billy would do the same thing in China, working with the government-controlled Three Self Church and telling the world that he saw no real evidence of human rights abuses. There is no such thing as a left-wing Christian. There is no such thing as a born-again Christian filled with the Spirit of Jesus Christ who supports left-wing causes, which include abortion, sodomy, socialistic government programs, etc. Whether he is unregenerate or simply deceived, Billy was wrong. And Billy didn't just placate the left. He embraced it, especially the left-wing liberal church. March 1962, John R. Rice of the Sword of the Lord wrote, quote, Dr. Graham is the front man, the chief spokesman for a growing group of people who believe in yoking up with unbelievers, contrary to the scriptures. They believe that a man may be saved without believing that the Bible is true or without believing in the virgin birth or the deity of Christ. They call people Christians who are really infidels by dictionary definition, that is, not believing the fundamentals of the historic Christian faith. Dr. Graham is the chief spokesman for those who believe in the inclusive policy of coexistence of unbelievers and believers, saved and lost, Bible believers and infidels in the same organization, end quote. Notice Rice 
used the same word that Graham himself used to describe himself, inclusive. In response to Graham's new relationship with the Pope, Roman Catholics would lavish Billy with gifts and honors throughout the 60s. For example, in 1963, Dr. Graham spoke at Belmont Abbey College, which is a North Carolina Catholic school. Then, a few years later, on November 21, 1967, he returned to Belmont Abbey to receive an honorary degree from this Roman Catholic Jesuit school. Billy was a good friend to Rome. In the 70s, the praise and adulation from Rome would continue. Meanwhile, Graham became a voice for Catholicism, paving the way for the Pope. On many occasions, papal visits would follow Graham's crusades, and the Pope would find that Billy had set the stage quite nicely. He received the 1972 Franciscan International Award for True Ecumenism. That's a code word for someone who serves Rome. And he received it from Roman Catholics, who appreciated what Graham was doing to strengthen Rome around the world. By 1973, true men of God like Bob Jones Sr. were convinced that Billy was being used of Satan. On page 275 of his autobiography, Graham himself admits that while in Seoul, Korea that year, quote, my interpreter, Billy Kim, had just graduated from Bob Jones and had received a letter from Dr. Bob warning that if he interpreted for me, his support from America would be cut off, end quote. And Billy goes on to say that Kim did interpret for him. Dr. Bob didn't want to pay someone to interpret for a false prophet, and Bob Jones Sr. had it right. In 1977, Graham preached a crusade on the grounds at Notre Dame University, sweeping thousands into Rome's clutches. In 1978, Billy had reached the point that he became, for the Roman Catholic Church, what Stalin called a useful idiot. Church, what Stalin called a useful idiot. Stalin referred to American liberals as useful idiots because they would do his work here on the continental U.S. Graham had already become a useful idiot for Rome. Beginning in 1978, he would become an intimately involved in service to the Pope. 78 was the year that Graham would accept an invitation from the Polish Ecumenical Council to preach in Poland. In a telling statement, the Ecumenical Council invited Graham, saying, Come and preach the same gospel here that you preached all over the world. In Poland, Graham spoke in Polish Catholic churches, telling them that as Catholics, they already believed the truth. He never preached the new birth, and never called on any of those poor victims of Rome to come out from the apostate whore. In Graham's own words, he said, quote, I spoke from the Bible on the meaning of the cross and explained why the death of Christ on the cross and the resurrection were central for Christians of all backgrounds. End quote. Yes, the way Billy preaches the cross, it would be acceptable to all professing Christians, including Catholics, liberals, Mormons, and anyone else who gives lip service to the cross and the resurrection. But unless they repent of their self-righteousness and sin and are born again by believing and trusting in the cross and empty tomb alone as payment for their sin, Billy's audiences in Poland and around the world are still going to hell. In a sign of sin to come, Graham was scheduled to have tea with a man named Carol Washtila before preaching at St. Anne's Catholic Church while in Poland. But Washtila was whisked away to Rome upon the death of the sitting Pope, John Paul I. Shortly after Graham's final press conference in Warsaw, Washtila was announced as the new Pope. Billy Graham and Pope John Paul II would become an ecumenical team until the Pope's death in 2005. So if you wonder how the Roman Catholic Church, the ecumenical movement, and the apostate Bibles have gained such ground in America, you can look to none other than Billy Graham. For decades, the world was smothered by the Billy Graham propaganda machine, which includes Christianity Today magazine, Decision magazine, Hour of Decision radio and TV programming, as well as the pro-Graham organs called the National Association of Evangelicals, 
national religious broadcasters, word publications, etc. These massive so-called ministries were pumping out materials for young people where Graham was painted as a hero for yoking up with Rome. In a book titled Billy Graham, His Life and Faith, Young Reader's Edition, written by Gerald Strober and published by Word, college age and teen readers are told, quote, Graham has been a forward-looking evangelical leader. The sad truth is that for much of the American experience, evangelicals have expressed hostility toward Jews, Roman Catholics, and others who did not share their doctrines and values. This does not mean that Graham is ecumenical in the current manner in which this word is used. He is not part of a movement for union between the Roman Catholics and various Protestant denominations, end quote. And that is a lie. Young people were being sold a bill of goods throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s, and into the new century. The book goes on for two pages describing the wonderful events that Graham has taken part in involving Rome and Roman Catholicism, Roman Catholic people, and Roman Catholic churches. It's no wonder that we have such an avalanche of apostasy today. The teens of the 70s are now the 50 and under crowd being engulfed in the emergent church movements. Billy Graham has served as Satan's Pied Piper taking the unregenerate rats into an ecumenical hell seated in Rome. It is clear from Graham's own account of his ministry in the 80s that Graham became an ambassador for Rome. Some accounts credit Graham with Reagan's establishment of diplomatic ties between America and the Vatican State, even appointing an ambassadorship. Regardless, Graham freely boasts of being the message boy for the Pope during his meeting with the insane president of North Korea, President Kim. Now we come to the most recent decade. I didn't pay much attention to Graham in the late 90s. I had written him off. But just when he seemed to be going away, he would show up again. And September 11, 2001 would propel him into worldwide prominence like never before. As he addressed the world in the National Cathedral, I listened to his remarks. I was troubled by the way he seemed to say something that sounded good to most listeners, but was just not right. For example, There's hope for the present, because I believe the stage has already been set for a new spirit in our nation. One of the things we desperately need is a spiritual renewal in this country. We need a spiritual revival in America. And God has told us in his word time after time that we're to repent of our sins and we're turned to him and he will bless us in a new way. We do not need a so-called spiritual revival. There is plenty of spiritual activity going on around the world and here in America. Go to Barnes & Noble's bookstore and look at the spiritual section. You'll find psychics, tarot card reading, mystical meditation, contacting dead spirits, conversations with angels, finding your spirit guide. The spiritual junk is endless. And what does Graham mean by repent of our sins? Graham is on record of supporting abortion rights. Graham has downplayed the seriousness of sodomy, saying that homosexuality isn't one of the bigger sins, and he boasts of all the wonderful sodomite friends that he has including his former ghostwriter, Mel White. Graham's definition of sin and repentance is not the Bible definition, and he does not call people to throw off their false religion and trust only in Jesus Christ for salvation. And as Graham continued to talk, there was an unmistakable divide. When he talked of Jesus, he never called on anyone to place their full trust and faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. He presented Jesus more as a martyr and someone who could feel our pain, but not as the Lord of Lords, who was the only way to heaven. Here in this majestic national cathedral, we see all around us symbols of the cross. For the Christian, I'm speaking for the Christian now, the cross tells us that God understands our sin and our suffering. That is not what the cross tells us. The cross speaks of the judgment of our sins. 
Isn't the cross for sinners? Isn't the cross for the Muslim, the Buddhist, the atheist, the Catholic, the Mormon, anyone who is not saved? The strange manner in which Graham presented the cross as something for Christians to find consolation in, rather than the place where the non-Christian must come for salvation, just doesn't sit right with me. The Spirit of God would not let me find comfort in Billy's words. I grieved for the lost who needed to hear that the cross was about God dying in the person of Jesus Christ for their sins. And this explains why the world loves Billy Graham. In Luke 6.26, Jesus said, Woe unto you, when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. For example, Katie Couric is a pro-abortion, pro-sodomite unbeliever, and Katie speaks well of Billy Graham. The Billy Graham Library was dedicated today in Charlotte, North Carolina. These days, as religion and politics too often mix in destructive ways, the 89-year-old preacher's life may in fact be very instructive. He walked that fine line between religion and politics and walked it well. He spoke out against apartheid in South Africa and in the 1980s advocated world peace and reconciliation with Russia and China. At home, he counseled Presidents Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Ford, and Bush Sr. On the Friday after September 11th, he joined Presidents Bush, Clinton, Ford, and Carter at the National Cathedral. Reverend Graham's sermon followed a prayer by an Islamic cleric. At a time when too many leaders use religion to divide us, Billy Graham found a way to both engage the issues and unite the country. And that's a life worth celebrating. Jimmy Carter, the former president, is a professing Christian who believes in killing unborn children embraces sodomites and calls for gay marriage, and advocates for the apostate World Council of Churches. But Jimmy speaks well of Billy Graham. Billy Graham, he was constantly broad-minded, forgiving, humble in his treatment of others. He has reached out equally for opportunities to serve God to all people. Well, my testimony today is that I'm just one of tens of millions of people whose spiritual lives have been shaped by Billy Graham. That was Jimmy speaking at the dedication of Graham's multi-million dollar library. Jimmy Carter resigned his affiliation with the Southern Baptist Convention. Why? Because the Southern Baptists teach that Mormons are lost and need to be saved. Carter believes Mormons are Christians. Now you need to understand that the Mormon Jesus is the brother of Satan and the offspring of a god, small g, named Elohim, who was once a man but had reached godhood. This demon Jesus of Mormonism wants good Mormons to become gods, small g, so they can have their own planet to populate by having celestial sex for eternity with billions of celestial wives in heavenly polygamy. And that's supposed to be heaven for the Mormon women. Jimmy calls this Christian. Don't forget that since 1957, for nearly half a century, Graham had an open and public position as quoted by the San Francisco News and repeated and put into practice all these years. Quote, anyone who makes a decision at our meetings is seen later and referred to a local clergyman, Protestant, Catholic, or Jewish. Billy is a friend of the world, and he openly denies Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 14:6 that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by him. Acts 4:12. Peter says there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But in 1978, McCall's Magazine reported Graham as saying, quote, I used to think that pagans in far-off countries were lost, were going to hell if they did not have the gospel of Jesus Christ preached to them. I no longer believe that. 
I believe there are other ways of recognizing the existence of God, through nature, for instance, and plenty of other opportunities, therefore, of saying yes to God, end quote. Billy would continue to deny scripture, reject fundamental doctrines, and deny the gospel. But apathetic Christians would turn a blind eye and ostracize anyone who dares speak out against Billy. Billy Graham has denied Jesus Christ as the only true Lord and Savior, but the backslidden church continues to adore him. Here he is talking with apostate Robert Schuler on his Hour of Power program. Tell me, what do you think is the future of Christianity? I think everybody that, that loves Christ or knows Christ, whether they're conscious of it or not, they're members of the body of Christ. And that's what God is doing today. He's calling people for, out of the, the world for his name, whether they come from the Muslim world or the Buddhist world or the Christian world or the non-believing world. Uh, they are members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. They may not even know the name of Jesus, but uh, they know in their heart that they need something that they don't have, and they turn to the only light that they have, and I think that they are saved, and that they're going to be with us in heaven. This is fantastic. I'm so thrilled to hear you say that. There is a wideness in God's mercy. 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 We have told you in other messages that the Jesus of Robert Schuller, Billy Graham, the liberals, the ecumenical movement, the emergent church, and these other last days false movements is not the Jesus of the Bible. Now you have heard it from their own mouths. In Matthew 7:14, Jesus said, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Schuler and Graham preach a false Christ. It is curious that Schuler is not mentioned in Graham's autobiography. He and Norman Vincent Peale, another apostate positive reprobate, would work with Graham to bring the church into apostasy. But Schuler is left out. But the McCall Magazine and Schuler interviews are not the only incidents where Billy denied Jesus Christ and the gospel as the only way to heaven. Here is Graham on Larry King Live, once again denying Christ. King will ask about Jews and Muslims, and instead of calling on them to repent and turn to Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, Billy just says he can't judge. What about those like the Jews, the Muslims, who don't believe as That's you believe? That's in God's hands. I can't be the judge. You don't judge them? No. Can you imagine? You're talking to a few million people on a secular news talk show and you have the opportunity to tactfully call on Christ-rejecting people of any false religion to turn to Christ for salvation. But instead, you just say, I don't judge. You don't have to judge. You have to faithfully preach the cross. Amazing. Billy goes on to admit he doesn't know what the word love really means, as he is willing to hide like a coward and let people go to hell all in the name of what he calls love. My calling is to preach the love of God and the forgiveness of God and the fact that he does forgive us. That's what the cross is all about, what the resurrection is all about. That's the gospel. And you can get off on all kinds of different side trails. And uh, when I, in my earlier ministry, I did the same. But as I got older, I guess I became more mellow. <laughs> and. Uh, more forgiving and more loving. Preaching that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven is not a side trail. And the fact remains that Billy has never believed that Jesus was the only way. His ministry has confirmed that Billy expressed his apostate views as early as 1960. And more loving. Preaching that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven is not a side trail. And the fact remains that Billy has never believed that Jesus was the only way. His ministry has confirmed that Billy expressed his apostate views as early as 1960 in an article in Decision Magazine. 
fundamentalists who spoke out were ignored, if not completely ostracized. Evangelicals were more concerned with numbers and acceptance in the world than with truth and purity of the gospel. The result has been that for nearly 60 years, Billy Graham has been a voice that is preparing the way for the coming Antichrist. Thanks to Billy Graham and his ministry, the Evangelical Church is now marching toward Rome and the apostate Orthodox and mainline churches are marching together. Men like Francis Beckwith, who was head of the Evangelical Theological Society, have joined the Roman Church. Men like Frankie Schaefer, son of Francis Schaefer, have joined the Orthodox cult. Chuck Smith Jr. and his church at Capo Beach, California, were disfellowshipped by Calvary Chapel, headed by his own father, Chuck Smith Sr., for bringing Catholic mysticism and the whole Billy Graham influence into his church. And this list could go on and on. The entire so-called emergent church movement is led by admirers and disciples of Billy Graham. Billy Graham is the leader and he is leading evangelicalism into apostasy. It should be noted that Billy Graham talks like a Freemason. That may be no mere coincidence, as he is reported to be a 33-degree Mason in a book written by Jim Shaw and co-authored by Tom McKinney titled The Deadly Deception. These claims are made on pages 104 and 107 of that book. Graham's ministry has threatened to sue Masonic groups for publicizing Graham's Masonic status. This claim has also been reported by Robert Morey and others. Whether or not Graham is in fact a Freemason, I do not know. But he preaches like a Freemason, and he is preaching Freemason doctrine, which is New Age and Universalist doctrine, that is to say that Jesus is only a way to God and not the way to God. Bible-believing Christians do not follow a man. We do not follow Billy Graham. We follow a book given to us by God who came as a man in the person of Jesus Christ. God has raised up a small remnant in these last days of committed Bible-believing Christians to stand against the apostasy by standing up for the book and being a witness and a testimony against these apostates. Will you join the apostasy or will you come out from among them and be separate? Your answer to that question reveals exactly who it is that you serve. Will you do what is easy, walking in the flesh with evangelicalism, or will you do what is right, walking in the spirit with a small but committed group of Bible-believing Christians around the world? laying down your life, your reputation, to serve the cause, the true cause, of Jesus Christ. Whose side are you on?